Hi there. Today's guest is going to be none other than legendary recording guitarist Dave Spinoza. Dave's worked with the very best, including James Taylor, Paul Simon, Donny Hathaway, Don McLean, Paul McCartney, John Lennon, Bonnie Raitt, Melissa Manchester, Carly Simon, David Sanborn. I think you get the idea. It's going to be a lot of fun. This series was conducted in the spring of 2020 via Instagram, and the audio and video quality do reflect that format. However, the words and insights of these guests are still priceless. We're talking with David Spinoza. David Spinoza is a New York-based guitarist. He's been on countless records, including many that are now considered some of the great ones. Uh, he played on the famous Paul Simon record, self-titled record called Paul Simon, and played the second guitar part on Me and Julio Down by the Schoolyard. Walking Man, James Taylor, he played and produced the album and arranged. Played on Ram with Paul McCartney, American Pie with Don McLean, Mind Games, John Lennon, Extensions of a Man, Donny Hathaway, Street Lights, Bonnie Raitt, Let Me Into Your Life, Aretha Franklin, Feel Like Making Love, Roberta Flack, Spy, Carly Simon, Hey Ricky, Melissa Manchester, Heart to Heart, David Sanborn. But in addition to that, you were playing- You sound like a name dropper. <laughs> well, you know, I gotta drop a few names so people know who the hell I'm talking to. But in addition to that, you were doing all this jazz. You were playing with the Thad Jones, Mel Lewis group, and you were playing with Buddy yeah. Rich. Mm -hmm. making records in, uh, you know, Archie Shep and Mike Minieri and Gil Scott Heron. And you got started really young, right? Yes. I, I, well, I started playing the guitar at 10 years old or eight, eight years old, eight to 10 years old. But I guess my first session work, I was around uh, 17, 18 years old. Yeah. Yeah. I read that that was for maybe for Arif, Arif Mardin. No, I I didn't meet, read Arif until after that. I think actually Tommy, you know Tommy Matola, who yeah. became you know president of uh, Columbia Records and stuff. Tommy and I were friends as kids, and he was actually trying to get a record deal for himself as a singer. That's and, crazy. And, and I think that he there was a little company either called Jubilee Records or something like that. The studio was called Groove Sound, and I think we did like a demo in there for Tommy. And he insisted that I played. He told the guys they were going to hire studio musicians. And he said, well, I have a friend of mine. He's a real good guitarist. And why don't you let him play on it? And they said, well, he can come along as long as he can keep up. And I went into the session. And the rhythm section was Bernard Purdy, Richard T., Chuck Rainey. Jesus and those were, the first, those were the first guys I, I met when I was 17, 18 years old. 17, 18, and one but of, you also came up with Rick Murata, right? Yes, yes. I actually came. Well, I, I grew up in Mamaronic. And yeah. uh, Rick, Rick Murata lived in Harrison and Andy Newmark, a lot of drummers. Andy Newmark lived in Mamaronek. And all of us sort of, yeah, we grew up together, played in bands together as when we were kids. Those guys are good little drummers. They're, They're good little drummers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's what Fink said. I posted about you today and Fink was yeah. like, hey, he's a good little guitarist. <laughs> uh, so what were you listening to, you know, from age 10? What, what music were you listening to that you started absorbing? guitar because you know in the 60s of course there was a lot of great guitar playing going on but then you were part of the evolution of a lot of sound yeah well you know it's interesting because there was this band that rick used to go see and i used to go see it was a local band they were from connecticut called the orchids most of the guys were from connecticut and there was sort of a guitar hero in that band you know local guitar hero but he was much better than any of us realized we just thought everybody played like him turned out he was very ahead of, the, ahead of his time his name was link chamberlain Lion, Lionel was his name, Link, and he played in this band called The Orchids. And we used to go see them as kids. They played in a local place called the Canada Lounge, and we'd go down and dance and listen to this band, and they were kind of a funk band. And I, that's the first time I ever heard the word funk. And, uh, and there was dance contests. I actually met Rick Murata in a dance contest, a dance contest. <laughs> Came down to me and Rick, and Rick won. And to this day, I want to strangle him. But... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and that's how we met, listening to this band. And we used to go hear this band all the time. And then listening to records, I listened to a lot of the Otis Redding stuff. I was into rhythm and blues, you know, James Brown. Somebody turned me on to the James Brown Live at the Apollo 1963 record. That was one of my favorite. It still is. It is their favorite live records. So that's that's where it got started. Jerry you know? is here. He's on, he's watching and he just said Rapsons 2. Oh, yeah. And there was another, yeah, Rapson was another place that Link wound up playing. Later, he sort of denounced playing funk and wanted to just play jazz and wound up playing actually with, uh, what's his name? Lieber, uh, Dave Lieber, Lieb Lieberman. They had like a jazz band that played in Port Chester. And Link at that point sort of gave up bending the strings and doing any of that kind of telecaster stuff. He got a big box and only wanted to play jazz and became like a jazz 
uh, you know, sort of aficionado, and that's all he wanted to do, and went in that direction. And by that time, I, I was not living in my marriage anymore. I'd become a studio guy. And I learned a lot about bending the strings and that style of playing from Link, which I thought all guitar players did. I didn't realize he was kind of one of the few that came up, like Roy Buchanan and, you know, these, and the guy that played with uh, Gary, Bur Gary uh, I can't think of his name, played with uh, Elvis. There were like a few Telecaster guys, you know, and he was part of that heritage. And I just sort of picked it up because that's what I heard. I thought everybody played like that. So when I came to New York, to be a studio guy a lot of the guys were playing the big boxes and stuff and the whole scene was changing and i come in with my telecaster playing this kind of hybrid funk country you know thing i didn't know i just thought everybody played like that turned out it was kind of unique and i they embraced me in new york and i started getting called for many types of different uh session gigs yeah <clears throat> yeah, yeah it that's was, it, it was pretty early on that that paul simon record you were 22 or something like that well, yeah something what? i don't remember yeah i was pretty young <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, I, I remember sitting there. I think I told you this story when I because I, I did. I hadn't known that you played on that record. And I think it was Phil Ramone and you talking about that. You came to hang oh. out at some session and you and Phil were talking about that record. <clears throat> oh, really? I don't, yeah. I, I don't and, recall. OK. And Phil was only an engineer on that record. That's right. No, Phil wasn't started. a producer. Yet. Most of the stuff I did with Phil Ramone in the beginning, uh, he wasn't a producer. He was, you know, he owned the studio, A&R recording. And he was mostly the engineer. You know, he got into producing later. Much know. later. Yeah, much later. Yeah. But he did produce on 52nd Street, which you played on, right? Yes. Yes, yeah. he did. Yes. So, yes. Uh, but, and you, and you produced uh, Walkin' Man. And I read the story about Walkin' Man is that you were working with Carly Simon at the time. Yes. I was, yes. Yeah, so, go ahead. I was, I was, well, I was Carly's musical director at the time. I, I had the band. I was writing the charts for her. We were, you know, she was playing around town, different places, the bitter end and tracks. And I just had signed a record deal myself with A&M Records. And she would come in and sit in with us. And, you know, it was like this, this is a bunch of people were always together. And uh, she just had started dating James, I think. And, and she, uh, James said he was looking to do something different for a new record. And he wanted someone that could also orchestrate and stuff. He didn't want, he was going a different direction. And uh, she must have suggested me, I, I think, I'm not sure if that's what happened. And he, he, one day he came to see one of her sessions, we were doing hotcakes, her record hotcakes. Yeah. He came by to visit and he was asked me to recommend uh, people that could, you know, they could write and arrange and produce. Mm -hmm. And I didn't name myself because I thought that would be kind of bizarre. So I said, well, there's Kenny Asher. I work with Kenny Asher a lot. And Leon Pendarvis is a great writer. And Rob Mounsey, I just met Rob had come to town. I said, there's this guy, Rob Mounsey. They could, they could probably do a great job with you. And he said, well, what about you? <laughs> and I was like, okay you know i wasn't going to recommend myself that seemed kind of bizarre so uh he's, he said well i got this one tune if you can make it sound good how about this i got this one tune called let it fall down i think it was called he yeah. said and if you can make i've I recorded it three or four times i can't get the feel right i that's something not right can you help me with it and if i like what you did you can produce my whole record and that's i, I produced it and and uh he liked it and that and that's how i wound up doing the rest of the record Man, uh, and I, uh, I love the sound of that record. I think the whole thing sounds great, and you did all the arranging on it. Had you had an arranged background? Had you gone to school for arranging or anything like that? Uh, no, I mean, I studied on my own. I studied. I, I took music theory in high school. I had a great music theory teacher, uh, Ray Bliss. He was a trumpet player, but he also had the choir, and you know, he was the music teacher guy. And there were two of us in the school that really excelled, and I always had horn bands actually with Rick in them and, you know, or Andy. And there was always like four or five horns and a, you know, B B3 player and a girl singer and a guy singer, like a show band. And somebody had to write the horn part. So I just started learn writing the horn parts off the neck of my guitar. I'd pick out some notes and go, oh, the first trumpet will play this, the second trumpet will... And I was learning as I was going the, the range of instruments. So I became a pretty proficient uh, horn writer at first because we were just doing sort of funk, funk type stuff, you know. I wasn't like big band swing or anything. It was more like James Brown. Otis Redding type writing. And so I learned how to do that and I learned the ranges of the instruments. And then uh, I left high school early because I went on the road with the band. I never went back to high school after 11th grade because I was on the road and I was getting called for stuff. And then I started just taking private lessons, orchestration with a classical lady and classical guitar with a guy who started the head of the uh, Manus School of Music guitar department, Leonard Bulletin. And I started studying classical guitar with him. So I was always trying to learn all the stuff but i did it on my own i never went to berkeley or anything like that i don't have a degree in music or anything 
it's really get it's really going to be standing your way, man. I'm sorry. You, you didn't yes, it, I guess it didn't hurt, but who? Kn I wouldn't suggest anybody do it that way. I mean, I kind of got lucky. <laughs> you know. No, but it was it was great. And then you know, you were talking about you had a deal, but you didn't make your record. You made your record in what seventy eight. I know, but I had to, I know, but it was so crazy. I had to deal like in 73 or 74. I was just, it's bizarre. I wasn't looking to be a solo artist. I, Aaron Russo was managing me at the time. He was managing Bette Midler and this guy named Jimmy Carroll and myself. And I wasn't really looking for a record deal, but he somehow, somehow somebody from A&M Records saw me, I think with Carly or something or with Jimmy Carroll. I was just the MD and uh, Jimmy was signed to A&M Records and, and Joey Levine was producing uh, the record, and I was the arranger for that record, Jimmy Carroll's record. And Herb Alpert must have heard me, and Jer Moss, you know, Jerry Moss and Herb Alpert, and they signed me. I, I didn't even have anything. So I was signed for four years and never made the record because I was actually busy writing jingles, producing other things. I wasn't even thinking about being a solo artist. And finally, Herb called me or Jerry said, man, you go, when are you going to make your record? You've been signed with us for four years. So I kind of <laughs> just wrote all the songs like an assignment and went in and just did the record like it was an assignment. I wasn't sitting there with a bunch of tunes I was trying to record. It was very strange. In the set, but in the 70s, weird stuff like that could happen. I don't think that's true today. But uh, it, I had this deal. I said, well, I better finish it. I better write some songs and finish the record. So that's how I wound up doing my solo record. I really wasn't looking to be a front man. <laughs> you know, I like being an MD and producing and all this stuff. It's an interesting record and it's quite a mix. I mean, after you yeah. made it, did you ever think like, well, I'll go out and do her a little bit with it? Or you're just like, well, I didn't, and that's what that's what that's when I sort of lost the not sort of I lost my deal. I mean, Jerry Moss called me up. He said, "David, you know, you're not very visible. I don't see you playing anywhere." <laughs> you know, because at the time I was working in the Jingle House, I'm writing commercial music and I'm producing other things, and I kind of liked being, you know, behind the scenes kind of thing. So I didn't really play out that much or anything. And then Jerry said, "You know, you can produce for us, and but we're going to drop you as an artist. But if you want to." you know, produce for us. We, you know, we love the way you produce and I always love the way you play the guitar, but it doesn't seem like you're really chasing. I said, well, I'm really not. And I was honest with him and he was honest with me and they dropped me as an artist, but I continued working, you know, producing other things. And of course, of which course. is what I wanted to do anyway. I really, I wasn't looking for the deal that like Aaron Russo got, Aaron Russo, I'm sorry, got me the record deal. <clears throat> Man, I, I want to ask about these, uh, and I don't want to harp on the early sessions completely, That's but right. I want to ask about because you started recording these pretty big records and playing major roles and sounding great on these records <clears throat> at a time where it felt like the way that records were being made was changing and the way that producers were acting was changing. You know, earlier records didn't necessarily use click all the time. That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> but you did but... use, use click on Walking Man. Uh, I don't know if we did on everything. We may have on some things, only because we just started discovering, you know, as music technology was coming in and everything, that it was if you had to fix something, it was a lot easier if you grid it up to some one thing. And the click became that one thing. You know, that's, well, it's easier if you're going to replace a piano part or a guitar part or whatever. You know, you could just do it better if you had some something to, to bow down to. So we all started bowing down to the click. You yeah, know, the clips are good, so. but but that was early times for people playing with the click, right? Because I talked oh, to yeah. Helton last week about this idea about in the early days, people didn't necessarily relate to it the way that they did, you know, once no. they got to the eighties and people just trying to bury it and yeah, yeah, it's true. And actually, what made a, a, most of us studio guys that were able to hang in there was because we did have good time, and that was a big deal that we could hang with the click, and that started to separate. I don't want to say the boys from the men because there are plenty of bands that don't play great with a click, but they sound great as a band, and that's a you know that's a particular skill. But the studio musician skill was that we had to play really in tune, really in time, you know, and stay with the click. That was a that was a, a must. For you know, but now there are bands that don't do that that I love. You know, they don't, they're not locked with a click, but they move around like a school of fish, and right. it sounds great. And it sounds great. So I'm yeah. not putting that down by any means. But the studio musician thing called for being very accurate with the click. <clears throat> yeah. Now, and and you said you were writing a lot of jingles, and I only learned that recently. You know, it's not it's not easy to get all the info on you. It's easy to yeah. get a lot of info, but not all the info. And and talk about that you were doing tons of jingles tony oh, God. you were doing tons yeah. of them oh yeah ridiculous i was well i was working with joey levine who had who had the, the company called crushing and joey was like you know he was mr bubblegum you know him and uh, i was trying to think of the guy uh, <clears throat> sugar sugar guy there saying sugar sugar 
became a producer. But the both of them sort of invented the whole bubblegum scene in Joe, and bubblegum was a big a draw for commercials because it was such commercial sounding music. And so I was working as an arranger, somewhat of a writer with Joey. So we were very busy uh, doing, doing TV commercials. And plus I was getting called to play on other people's commercials like Susan Hamilton had a company, HEA Music, and I was playing playing guitar for their commercials and writing stuff for Joey. And that whole thing was, a you know, it was kind of the heyday of TV commercial, national TV commercials. So, yeah, I was busy with that. It was another reason I didn't make the record. I was busy writing all that stuff. All Yeah, you know, we could call on Monday and I have to write for a 35, 40 piece orchestra by Wednesday to do, wow. you know, a, six, a 60 second spot, a 30 second spot, a 15 second spot that was going to go on the air Friday. You know, so it was, yeah. it was, it was cool. fast and furious. And you were still doing tons of sessions at that time as well. Yeah, yeah. I would just play, play recording dates, go home, write, write the commercial till two in the morning, go to the copyist's office. Samuel Charlotte was a music copy. I'd go there at seven in the morning, fall asleep on his couch. They'd wake me up at 9.30. I'd grab the music and run down to the studio. And the, the orchestra would be in there, and then I'd have to conduct the, conduct the orchestra. Wow. And was yeah. that a lot of those at Columbia on 30th Street or the big orchestra? No, lot, no, a lot of those were at Automated Sound. There was a couple of studios that were really known for jingles because they were very fast. The engineers were really, really fast and good. Uh, so it was like automated. Some were done at A and R, Phil's place. But it got. It was almost like they were jingle studios and then they were record studios. You know, some of them could cross both lines. But the jingle studio, they had to be fast. And there was no going in there and saying, let me hear the bass drum for two hours. You know, when yeah. you go in there, you know, you couldn't do that. It wasn't that. It wasn't like making a record. Everything had to be very fast. So most of the jingle studios were geared to speed, you know. <clears throat> yeah. Matt, can you talk a little bit about coming in? You worked with all these different artists, and they all have a different flavor and different mm -hmm. producers. And coming in and kind of fitting in with what they wanted. I, I've heard it said many times, and even Phil used to say that Paul Simon was very particular and he would take a long time and sometimes yeah. spend a lot of time spinning around on stuff. Oh yeah, I mean there was what you had to once you knew some of these artists you had to sort of gear yourself up for the way they like to work. You know what I mean? Like some people like when I did John Lennon's Mind Games, he just went in, played the song twice and you were supposed to learn it and then you do two or three takes and he was done. He wanted to go on to the next thing, you know, which I saw was a very big difference between him and Paul McCartney because Paul McCartney would take time getting drum sounds and you know, much more produce the record as it went. And sometimes you'd work on one song all day, or sometimes two days, three days until he was happy with it. So you'd have to sort of learn each artist's way that they like to proceed and gear yourself up or down for it. I mean, I've done dates where we had to play 16 songs and four hours and then i've done dates we do one song for a week <laughs> so yeah. you you would have to kind of know and sometimes there was an arranger and everything was written so you had to be able to read but then sometimes there was no arranger and they wanted you to do it by head by learning it like mccartney just wanted to play the song for you and you'd learn it and play it over and over again sort of more like band style like you're in a band and then you would just either make up a part or a lot of times paul he was so great at coming up with parts he would sing you a part and then you would just mimic it or play it till he, till he liked it and then he didn't get a good sound on it and and you record so you really had a each artist had a different way of working you had to get comfortable with the way they like to work i mean paul simon i loved his records but i loved hearing his record. he made great records i didn't always enjoy playing on them because they were really laborious sometimes i would sit out in the waiting room for six hours not play a note he would just work with Richard T. Then he'd work with the bass player. Then he'd come out and say to me, okay, now let's work on your part. I was sitting there for six hours. By the time I went in, I was exhausted. I didn't even yeah. play the note, you know, and then he wants to start working on guitar parts and you're exhausted from waiting. And meanwhile, he makes great, this is no, you know, not putting down Paul Simon, he makes great records and that's the way he works. But for me, it, it didn't totally work with my, I'm a little, I'm a, I'm a fast twitch guy, you know, I kind of yeah. want to get in and get it done. And I don't mind overdubbing or fixing a part or whatever you need to do to get it more perfect. But, you know, some people are real, you know, taskmasters at it. Donald Fagan, you know, Walter Becker, may he rest in peace. I mean, what great records did they make? But boy, you better be geared up for a long session. Yeah. And then, <laughs> so, you know, a lot of musicians, well, not a lot, but some musicians yeah. fell, fell into the trap of using enhancement to get through those sessions yes enhancement enhance yeah. enhancement yeah, yeah my enhancement was mostly coffee i have to admit i didn't get too much into the uh enhancement yeah thing yeah always scared me kind i'm glad it did so yeah yeah well uh, you're still uh, around and 
uh, and you're doing all these sessions. Was there any time to listen to music on your free time? Would you go home and go, wow, I'd really like to clear my head and listen to something else where you're just done? When you have yeah, yeah, yeah. I would, well, it's funny you say that because like, I always sort of cringe when somebody says, oh, Dave Stone, I was a jazz guitar player. I never considered myself a jazz guitar player. I considered myself a, a musician, you know, a guitarist, but I was sort of a chameleon. But when I go home and listen to music, I would listen to Wes Montgomery. And some of the lines I developed my own in terms of playing jazz, I actually didn't get from guitar players. I did a lot of listening to like Lee Morgan, yeah. and Freddie Hubbard and that kind of stuff. And, and, and you know, uh, Wynton Kelly, I would get, I would try to get my lines from people that played a different instrument than I did because I thought it'd be more interesting to play those kind of lines. So I would consider myself a closet jazzer, you know, but basically a rhythm and blues guitar player. But at home, I would listen to, yeah, to Wes. And, you know, I, of course, I listened to the Miles Davis records. I'm familiar with all those records. Uh, yeah, but that's that's kind of what I would listen to. And then when I got into classical guitar, I started listening to, uh, you know, Segovia and Julian Bream and John Williams, who's my favorite classical guitarist. And, you know, just tried to be, you know, the studio thing is about being eclectic. So I don't consider myself any one you know, great in any one idiom. I can I can do them all, and I can read, and I can make stuff up. So, that's a good that's a good thing to be a studio guy. You know. <clears throat> yeah, and then it wouldn't feel as much of a crazy gear shift to go from like a Bonnie Raitt session to a Herbie no. Mann record to a yeah, know. yeah. No, some days where like I do a 10 a.m. jingle that I just wrote, like uh, you know, and arranged. Like one of the first things I arranged, I got on the air. Valerie Simpson sang on. It was uh, you know, sometimes you feel like a nut, sometimes you don't. I'll enjoy that. That was Valerie Simpson. I arranged that in the morning. In the afternoon, I went to an Aretha Franklin session. And at night, I went to a Herbie Mann session. That's all crazy. In same, all in the same day. That's crazy. You know? And uh, you were working, that was all through crushing. And yeah. did you have to put on, was there a lot of dog and pony show for clients at that time? Or was it, were you isolated from that? I, I was isolated from that because I was mostly uh, the arranger not the writer you know joey levine wrote the stuff and joey was great at well great at writing hooks obviously he was great hooks and he was great with the clients he knew how to how to talk to them and uh, he won a lot of a, a lot of the competitions because he was really good at that and uh myself john trope we were both arrangers we we're both you know guitarists but also john was an arranger up there chris palmero was writing a lot of the stuff with joey and he, he, then he started getting into arranging. He had an interest in arranging, too. He's a terrific musician. And he started writing and arranging. So, I mean, there was a, there was a lot of creative people involved in the, in the jingle world in New York City. Tremendous uh, amount of talent. Singers, crazy great singers, you know, that could sight sing and all that yeah. stuff. I mean, that, that kind of went away later on. A lot of the rock singers came in. You didn't really have to know how to solfege. But like the, the older singers, uh, you know, Leslie Valerie, Leslie Miller, Valerie Simpson, Kenny Karen, these singers were terrific music. You know, they were musicians that sang. Yeah. They could sight, re sing anything and, uh, you know, sing in tune and in time. It was terrific. It was a really terrific bunch of people. Very, very talented, very schooled and very talented. Yeah. And then, and then eventually you started working more with, uh, you were doing these, a lot of stuff with, with recordings. Is it fair to say that you didn't work with Carly for a while and then you came back and did more Carly records? Yeah, I didn't see her for a while. We just sort of lost touch and nothing nothing bad happened. We just sort of drifted away. You know, I was doing some stuff and, and my record was coming out and I was going to go out and play and the guys I was playing with weren't the same guys that backed up in her band and she always wanted those guys so in case she wanted to sing you know because carly had the stage fright thing you never knew when she was going to sing or cancel a gig or whatever and, and then i was trying to go out to play my stuff and i was using different guys than were in her band and i, and I don't think she cared for that she wanted but i you know I, my, my whole life musical life was changing and i sort of moved on and she moved on but it wasn't a bad vibe it was just drifted away <clears throat> yeah well uh and it's amazing and then and then the donny hathaway stuff Oh, well, Donnie, Just, I got to so, say, I, I can't say enough about Donnie. Donnie well, Hathaway was one of my favorite recording artists of all time. And what a, shame, what a shame that his life was cut short. I mean, I could, it's hard for me to talk about Donnie without crying. I mean, I, I did so many sessions with Donnie as a piano player. I didn't even realize what a singer he was. When I first started working at, at Atlantic Records, you know, I played dates with Dr. John. I didn't know him as Dr. John. I, I, know, I used to call him Mac. I didn't, I didn't know that Mac Webinac and Dr. John were the same person for years. I mean, that's how naive, how young I was when I got into the scene. And with Donnie, I'd play dates, and he would just be the piano player. 
on dates. And yeah. then when he invited me to work on Extensions of a Man, which is one of my favorite albums that he did, I was like, I had no idea he could sing like that. I mean, it was so, so he was one of my favorite people. I, I really adored Donnie. We became friendly, you know, through the years. And it was a shame. That what a, I don't really know what happened to him and why, but, <clears throat> but what a loss. Oh, what a loss. And those records are so incredible. And yeah. that you participated in, in, in several of them. It's still, you know. Yeah, they were, and, uh, they were and, great. And, and talk, can you talk a little bit about uh, the Roberta Flack thing as well? Because you played with her quite a bit and recorded yes. with her quite a bit. I did do some recording with her and I played live with her at some point. I, I, would some, I mean, she would usually use Eric Gale. And a few times I, I filled in for Eric Gale on some things and uh yeah we did we did a, a thing at symphony orchestra up in edmonton symphony orchestra i think that's on youtube now they, they actually play someone someone just gave me the uh i hadn't seen it in years but we did that and leon pendarvis was in the band leon i think was the md at the time harry whitaker did you know the piano player he was in yeah the band. yeah yeah it was a great Idris muhammad great band yeah. So yeah. I go out and play with her on some stuff and that was always fun that was always a great band and she sang beautifully and you know it was really really nice i did a lot of work with her yeah, and you played on. You played on uh, "Feel Like Making Love," the the album, right? And I th I think I'm on the. I'm not on the. I don't think I'm on that song. I think it's like Jeff Marinoff and I, I forgot who. I don't. I don't think I'm on that particular song. Which you're but you're on, on the album for yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm probably I'm on the album. Yeah, actually, it's funny. Roberta did something that nobody really ever did. You know, studio musicians, you go in, you charge whatever you charge. I was a double scale player. You know, uh, Richard T. I think was a triple scale player because nobody was Richard T. And uh, so, but it's funny, I played a, on one of her songs, maybe called Early Every Midnight or something like that. I played a guitar solo live, and it was the first day I met Anthony Jackson. He was just coming on the scene. And we wow. were doing this at Bell Sound. I'll never forget it. And I had to play, and I played a live solo without punching in. It was like live with the track, and, and Roberta loved it, I guess. I didn't remember it. And then about three weeks later, I'm at the Hit Factory working on, I think, James's record. I'm producing James. And Roberta says, can I come over? I want to, I want to give you something. So she comes over to the Hit Factory, and I want to break. And she comes inside uh, Jerry Ragavoy's office, because, you know, Jerry owned the hit factory. And she hands me a $1,000 check. I said, what's this for? She said, I just want to thank you for that guitar solo you played on my record. Oh, man. And I was like, what? Like, you're giving me? I said, you don't have to do that. You paid me. I, I got paid for the record. She said, no, it was, it was beautiful. It was genius. I want to give this. And she forced me to take the check. I felt funny taking it. I felt like I was stealing money or something. But yeah, she's oh. the only one that ever tipped me, tipped me for playing on the record. It was like- That's a un unbelievable. Yeah, and, Roberta. And it's, you know, as these producers started to evolve, I guess I, I sorry, I keep coming back to this idea about- That's okay. About producers, because as, as the time went by, because. Obviously, I, I did, wasn't involved in any of those sessions, but in the early sessions, yeah. it felt like producers sort of had a, more of a standoffish, or you know, they stayed in the background more with the sound of a record and arrangers and musicians yeah. and artists were were taking charge. Yeah, that, no, that's interesting. They're saying that because I came in, yeah, during the time when that was changing. I mean. A lot of producers back in the day were businessmen. You know, they were suits. They weren't necessarily yeah. creative people. They were they weren't necessarily musicians or writers. They were suits. They were guys that got the guy the record deal and they showed up and they sort of just made sure, you know, their money didn't get wasted. You know, they right. weren't create and as as the time went on, more of the actual artists became producers. People that could either or the engineers, for instance. A lot of a lot of the recording engineers just did engineering, but they didn't produce, like Phil. He was an engineer. Yeah. Or uh, you know, the guys from like Record Plan who wound up doing uh can't think of his name now, uh, Jack Douglas who wound up producing a lot of things. And you know, these guys were started out as engineers, just like I started as a guitar player. But more and more that when people found that I could write and that, you know, guys had an input that was more than just putting the money into the project, we started to take more charge of it. You know, like funny, people will ask me, what's the difference between a producer in a movie and a producer on a record? And I would say you'd have to look at it as like a director, like a movie, but a movie, they have a director. So when right. you say you produce a record, like to me, I directed the record. I chose the material. I arranged the material. It, it's more like being a director of a, of, of a movie uh, when they use the word producer for a record. So yeah, it's and more so. Yeah, more more of the creative people started to produce later on, which was great. When you look at Arif's history, he was a supervisor on quite a few records in the 60s. Yeah, that's right. And then he, people realized that he could write, you know, he was a terrific arranger. Yeah, he was, yeah. He, he was, he had already done that. But. Oh yeah, he'd already been an arranger and did a lot of stuff. So later they started letting him do all that. And then he brought that 
to all those sessions because he had that knowledge. He was a terrifically knowledgeable man. And he was great with the artists. I was not that great working with the vocalists and stuff like that. Reef knew, he understood the psychology also of working with artists, you know, and, and making them feel good about themselves because you don't want an artist questioning themselves while they're in the studio. I was kind of used to more working with the jingle singers who were more like musicians. You didn't have to baby them to get a performance from them. They just, right. they, they were professionals, they just did it. But some artists, you have to, you have to know the psychology of, of, of how to deal with artists. I, I can't say that I was that great at that because I was just working mostly with, with really high, highly, highly professional people that were just gonna come in and do it in one take and leave. But so, you were also, I, I think that you're also, <clears throat> you're very, uh, you're very understanding of the various psychological elements that happen. Oh, I, in oh yeah, but sometimes I was impatient, I think. I might have just been a little bit impatient. <clears throat> well, uh, uh, I guess my point about this is that eventually producers started to get their, their tendrils into records and sort of take more more charge and have a, a more exalted position. And, and I would see that with Phil, where he was he was overseeing, but but he was still the center of the whole thing yes and he would have his team and uh you know arrangers and but it would still be like phil's name was that was that the feeling the modern feeling with phil was that the same on 52nd street that you recall yeah yeah yes yes i mean because there had to be some one person in the end because as you know with with making right, playing a song or writing a song there's so many different opinions you're going to have right and and there's like this wrong way and a right way there's just this way and that way so well, somebody like Phil does or somebody like myself when I was a producer, you, you just have to be the one that breaks the tie and says, right. you know what, this, this is, that chord's okay. Yeah. I'm going to use that. You know, that you're, yeah. you know, could have been this. Right. <laughs> right. You're, just, right. you're just the one that says, you know, I like the A2. Let's use that. Someone's got to just make the decision. It doesn't mean it's the ultimate decision. It's just someone's got to break the tie. Yeah. And, I and know that's what, you know, producer does. And, uh, uh just to just to uh depart here a little bit yeah i know you you still feel uh allergic about this solo but everybody would want to know the mm -hmm. story about the dr john solo and i listened to yeah. it about four times in the last four yeah. days yeah and i think it's fantastic all of it exactly as is wow that's so funny i get i do i cringe when i hear the solo in the one spot that drives me nuts because oh, I wasn't. I think that's the. I think that's. I know, but that became right that there. became the. I know it became the juice. But I'm just saying, you know, remember, you know, I did it, so it's hard for me to. It's like looking at your own baby pictures or something. Yeah. It's like, uh, and you know, the way it happened was an interesting thing. I was at, and I've told the story before, but I'll, I'll tell it again. Uh, I was at Atlantic Records, and I don't know. I was coming out of one session. I think it might have been a reef. I'm not sure if it was a reef who was doing Dr. John or. This, the other producer, I can't think of his, his name, just went out of my head now. I was, I was going from one session to another, and I was in the hallway, and I was getting ready to catch a cab to go to a jingle session. And somebody saw me in the hallway. They were in a little mix room at it. Not, they weren't in the big recording room. They were in a mix room at Atlantic, and they saw me standing with my guitar. And uh, Dr. John goes, hey, Spinoza, what are you, hey, where are you doing? Where are you going? You know, in, in that Dr. John voice. I, and I go, I'm on my way to Jingle. Hey, you got a minute? You got to come here and throw a guitar solo on this thing. We were going to have a sax solo. We're mixing it. We forgot to put the solo in. I said, I said, well, man, I got like 15 minutes. I really just come in. We got a little Fender twin in the corner. We'll mic it, touch it. So I didn't, I go in, I take the guitar out and I'm in this, my guitar's in a soft case. So, you know, the tuning pegs move around in that case. So you got to, so I said, then they roll it to right to the spot where the solo's gonna be. So I don't hear the song. I never really hear the song. They just rolled it like two bars before my solo. And, I, and he goes, it's an E flat, you know, you'll hear it. So, uh, and so it starts and I plug in and I play that solo, right? For like it's one, I play that solo once and I go, all right, let me tune, my G string's really out of tune. I overbent that note, let me, let me tune it up and do a, new, do a few more and then I gotta go. They said, I thought you gotta go, that was magic, get out of here. I said, no, 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 it wasn't magic. I overbent the note. My guitar's not even in tune. Let me let me do it again. No, get and they basically threw me out. And I left feeling really like I got away with murder. It felt terrible to me. I, I didn't like I mean I never even heard the solo back. So now cut to three months later, I'm in a taxi cab with three guitars. I'm in the back of the cab. I got my 12 string and a steel string acoustic and my telly. I'm going to some other session. And that song comes on the radio. No, I never heard it. So while it's on the radio, 
I don't know it's that I don't know it's right time wrong place because I only heard the part I played on the 16 bar solo so the cab driver sees me looks in back so oh, you guitar player you'd love this is my new favorite solo and he turns it up really loud and knee-jerk reaction because I would never go around telling people I'm a studio guy or something I just go oh my god that's me he turns it down he goes yeah right buddy <laughs> And I never told New York moment. I never heard the solo. So no I went to the idea. colony shop later. I bought the record and then I heard the solo. But I was like, oh, my God, they kept that. That was it. That solo. It's, to this day, it drives me crazy. But everybody oh, loves it. It's one of those things. It's so great. And I think, <laughs> I think it's an example of, of, of the imperfections and, and, you know, the term happy accident. I think that's a happy accident, even though it wasn't. I guess. It wasn't meant to be. I was not looking to, to, I've never been to note to an augmented fifth in my life. I don't, I just, it's not, it's not like a typical guitar bend. I guess that's what makes it different. I don't know, you know? Yeah. So. And, and you saw these records evolve from this thing. And I, I keep going back about this thing about the click and the grid. And then records yeah. eventually got to the space where they were so kind of perfected. And did you feel, were you feeling like music was starting to lose its soul at all with that stuff? Yeah, I, I did. Although I must admit, I, I did embrace the technology, like for, for someone my age, you know, I'm, I'm 70 now. Uh, I, I, I have kept up with all the technology and stuff, but I didn't like what, how it was being used. But I, but I appreciated the technology, but I did think a lot of the soul, yes, was uh, coming out of the, coming out of the records. Because when you think about those records, those early, uh, you know, the 70s records, and I think that's such a classic recording time, especially in New York. But, yeah, that was uh, a great, really creative time in New York. Really creative time. And those records are all kind of greasy. I wonder, do you think that some of that has to do with the fact that they were done quickly? Or was it just that, that uh, it was like a lot of guys who worked together all the time? I mean, those records... It was probably a combination of both, you know, because in New York, we, they didn't take a lot of time like the L.A. I used to love the way records sounded coming out of California, the Hollywood studios. They took a lot of time to get great, great, great sounds and stuff. And guys could show up with all their instruments. You know, the guitar players would show up with a trunk full of instruments and the synth guys would show up with like two telephone booths looking yeah. filled with synths. You know what I mean? Not, in New York, you could only take to the studio what you could fit in a taxi cab. You know, right. Back then we took cabs. I wouldn't even think of taking a subway back in the 70s. So whatever you could fit in the cab, you know, two little pedals, you know, a, a overdrive and a delay. And that was it. We didn't have any complicated setups. And the, so, you know, but a lot gets done because of limitations. Sometimes a limitation makes you do things you wouldn't do ordinarily, you know. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Like just when you write a song and you say, I'm, gonna, I'm only going to use four chords. I'm not going to go crazy and see if you can write a great song with only four chords. So sometimes the limitation actually makes you come up with stuff you wouldn't have thought of without yeah. the limitation. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's interesting. So yeah. I, think that's, I think that was part of it. I'm looking out of the side of my eye at your, yeah. at your super long list of records here just because I, I, want, I want to think more about all this yeah. stuff. You know, you're credited as playing with James Brown on Star Time. Yeah, I did play on something. I think Dave Matthews, uh, not Dave Matthews, the singer, Dave Matthews, the jazz cat. Uh, he was his MD at the time, and I did some records with him when he was producing James Brown or arranging for James Brown. Wow. <clears throat> yeah. What, what, that, was a, that was a trip for me because I idolized James Brown. When I was a kid, absolutely. Uh, my, my, girlfriend, my first girlfriend, Georgine, who I wound up marrying, we used to get on the train and uh, she was. Well, she lived in Pelham. I would. I would be in Marinick, and she would jump on the train in Pelham, New York, and we'd get off at 125th Street and not tell our parents. They would have been scared to death that we were going to Harlem by ourselves, and we'd go see James Brown. I must oh. have swum 50 times in 1964, 65, when he was in the top of his game, and that was a big wow. inspiration for me. So to wow. meet him and play on a record like five years later, being on a record, which was like bizarre. Well, this bizarre. explains a lot of a lot about how you play the, the way you do. I mean, you put so much information into your head and your body at a young age with listening to all these, all these yeah. musicians. Yeah, yeah, I did. Uh, yeah, and it's funny, when I wound up playing with Paul McCartney, and I haven't told Paul this, it wasn't, I, I wasn't like a Beatles fan as a kid very much. I, I got into the Beatles maybe by Abbey Road or something I thought I liked, but I didn't like the original stuff. To me, it was, and I was probably listening to the same people they were listening to. You know, so yeah. and we were around the same age. So I wasn't that, that, you know, that impressed. When I got called to play with McCartney, I was like, OK, that's pretty cool. But I wasn't like a Beatles fan yet. 
I, now I am. I mean, I, yeah. how could you not be? But at the time, I, I was probably listening to the same people that they were listening to in England. And, and I knew some great guitar players and great players, you know, already. Uh, even from Westchester, where I grew up, there were so many great musicians coming out there. T-Bone Walk, you know, the bass player wound up working with uh, Hall & Oates. And there were some great players that came out of Westchester County. So I grew up with all those guys. So I wasn't that impressed with, with the Beatles when they first came out. All my friends could play as good as them or, you know, it was they couldn't write as good as them. I mean, the writing was the real deal with the Beatles. But uh, yeah, so it was funny. When I got called to do it, I thought I was the least likely guy to get called to do it. But when I worked with McCartney, I, I did see the genius. I heard the genius. Yeah, and then you worked with Ringo later. You worked with Yeah, Ringo. I worked with Ringo. I worked with John. I worked with John on uh, Mind Games. I think I did, I think I must have done, I'm trying to think what I did first. I, I don't know if I did Mind Games first or Ram. I forgot the I order. You did Ram but, first, as far as I can tell. Ram, okay, I yeah, I forgot. First. Yeah, yeah, probably. Uh, but yeah, what, but boy, could he, man, to he, hear him sing in a studio without a microphone, his own songs, or, and he could sing the melodies different every time, and each one was better than the last one. It was unbelievable. I said, my God, this guy is a natural melodist. Yeah. You know, it's just, just absurd. Uh, <clears throat> oh, my wife just brought this to me from outside. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> because you were, she's laughing. That's you funny. The commercial. You, did yeah. you keep writing commercials into the 90s? See, this is something I, I about. No, I think. I think I stopped around 80, 88, 89 or something like that. You know, the business was changing drastically by the 90s. You know, I don't know that there's a real studio scene left. I mean, I do stuff at home where people send me files. As you know, we you know, send files to each other and yeah. do that stuff. I do. I, I just did a bunch now, especially during the Corona, the Corona time. Yeah. In, you know, right. we're, all, we're all sending files and, and, you know, I'm working. In fact, I'm working on a, a record that I'm just doing. Uh, I'm actually doing Beatles big band record that I, just decided to do, and I got different guys play, putting, playing all the parts at home. The trumpet players play their parts. They send it all back to me, and I mix it. And it's oh, all Beatles great. stuff done, done, you know, swing, done differently. And, you know, not, it's not like a cover band. So I've been doing that as a thing. So, you know, whatever. But you were still busy all the way through the 90s, and you were busy. busy. The, yeah, you yeah. were busy into the 2000s, but I hear on good authority from a yeah. friend of yours that about uh -oh. 2004, you were ready to be done. It's by yeah, the I, yeah, I mean, I kind of burnt out, you know, that's a lot of pressure in the studio, you know what I mean? I, I definitely was somewhat of a burnout. And before I got did something stupid, I just thought, nah, I gotta, I gotta stop now. Yeah, I was in it a long time. You know? Yeah, you were. I started very young, because I started, you know, a lot of guys' careers don't get started till they're 28, 20, 30. By the time I was 30, I was on you know, so many records and stuff. And, and the pressure of being in the studio, and the pressure of like, especially being a guitar player, uh, having the sight read stuff, you know, the arrangers, you, I got a name as, oh, this guy can read. Once they, once they say this guy can read, the arrangers start writing more stuff because they go, well, he can read. <laughs> and after a while, you get to a point where I can read, but, you know, I can't sight read, you know, like a first violinist. Yeah. So, it, it, you know, the pressure of that started to get everything. You know, there was a lot. There was a lot to it, you know. And I wanted to get back. I, I feel like now music is almost a hobby again, and I feel like a kid. I'm excited about working on stuff, you know? Oh, it's not great. just a living anymore, you know, so. Well, I mean, it, it, it obviously originally came from a love. and uh, Absolutely. And if it returns to a love, and this hopefully this time, in this time, musicians can sort of refigure out what they love about what why they started in it in the first place without the well, pressures of Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, this whole, corona, this whole corona thing is mojo on all of us. Like, you know, yeah. look, look at the, the Broadway. I mean, like the scene in, in New York now, you know, when guys come out of music school and move to New York, their big thing is they want to have a Broadway show. That's become the thing. There is no studio scene to really speak of. So having your own chair on a Broadway show is a big deal. Now Broadway's dark. Yeah. We're all, and these all, there's a lot of great young musicians coming out of all these music schools, come to New York, you know, with their date book and their instrument, and like, where's the work? Right. You know what I mean? Right. And it's like, uh oh, and now we're in this now we're in this situation. So I mean I really feel for them, you know, that's that's a tough time to get started in music. And you played on Broadway, mm -hmm. you played in hairspray, is that right? I did. I did hairspray, yeah, and I did the soundtrack. The soundtrack and Mark Shaman is movie. here, he's watching, I think. Oh, is he? Oh, hi Mark. Yeah, Mark, great guy. <laughs> great writer. Pretty Yeah. That's funny. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. And, but now you're working from home and you are also talking with musicians and people who want to know about your stuff 
And mm -hmm. tell me about this website where you're answering where you're answering questions. Oh yeah, there's this website a couple of friends of mine started. It's called Meat Hook, as in M E E T H O O K dot com, and you can go on there and request uh, uh, like a sitting with me. You know, there's a fee. And people have different fees that they charge. I think Steve Gad's on there. A bunch of people are on there, and you can. Uh, I have to like put a calendar on when I'm available or something. But if you go and check it out, yeah, meetup.com, you can go in and find and talk to some of the guys. And, you know, either I, I, I will talk about the guitar or give you guitar instructions or talk about arranging or I'm saying, you know, like I, I use the program Sibelius, you know, to write arrangements and, and I use Digital Performer and I've got, become pretty good at all, all those things. I would answer questions at stuff or if people just want to know what it was like to be in the studio with the Aretha Franklin, they just are curious. You know, I'll do an hour with them, but that's yeah. what it's called. It's called meet meet hook dot com, and you can request a sitting or a viewing, or we have a conversation, like we're doing. Yeah. Only have to only have to pay for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not going to use up all the answers right now. No, we've so talked for hours and hours, and it's been such a yeah. pleasure to talk to you. And it, it was a rare pleasure that a few times I got to to record with you. So thank you so much for joining me yes. today and talking to everybody and. And, uh, well, th thank you. It's been a pleasure. Anytime. And you're one hell of a talented guy yourself, I must say. Oh, that's very sweet of you to say. Thank you so much, Dave. All right. Have a be great well. day. You okay. too. Thanks for joining me for this episode of The Right Key. If you enjoyed the episode, there's a lot more coming. Please click the subscribe and like buttons below. If you want to know more about me or our guests, you can find lots of information in the link just below the video. See you next time.